I can take this post-it note off my notes saying, don't forget to record, stupid. And uh, so first things first, let's go ahead and bring up Rhino. And let's talk about this, right? So um, you, can have, you can have your software sort of um, uh, render with your, your CPU, your typical processor. But the nice thing about video cards is that they, they're actually quite nice now, especially if you specifically bought a system with a nice uh, uh, video card, it's the GPU. Um, you can actually have your renderer plug into that GPU and, and run things, and things go a lot quicker, right? Um, oftentimes, these things are optimized for a system that actually has a really good video card. And if you were buying something that said, you know, graphics, accelerated, sort of, you know, used with CAD, used with gaming, right, those come with some kick-ass uh, video cards, right? So when we see GPU, that's what we're talking about, this sort of, um, the processing through the, the, uh, the video cards that uh, you have, rather than um, relying on just the processor running everything else on your computer. Give me just a second for this to pop up. So I do want to talk about a few settings in order for you to be able to key in on your computers. Right? And um, if you haven't yet, then you can hopefully optimize. And feel free to follow along if you want. Again, I'm also recording this. So if you miss something you need to look back, you have the recording to refer back to. Um, if you are trying to follow along and you miss a step or you, you, um, or you get behind, that's fine too. Then you can, you can pick up back with the recording where we left off, you know, sometime after class when you're doing your, your sign, okay? So feel free to, you're not gonna offend me at all if you're staring at your computer just as much as up here, all right? Um, but one thing I'm gonna do is go to the Tools pull down in Rhino and go to Options. Tools pull down, Options, right? That's all, most of the settings in Rhino, right? you're, uh, you're gonna find them there. And, you know, for instance, if you go to Appearance and Colors, that's how you can set your background color your selection color and all that sort of stuff if you'd like to customize that stuff. Um, this is where you can set your units, right? So um, I have my default set to inches instead of millimeters because I just think it's annoying to start off with millimeters. I just, my brain isn't wired that way. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to cycles. Okay. So if you look at over here on the left-hand side, there's a menu. Um, so I'm going to go to the cycle settings, right? And you can see in my case, it says, well, you have the CPU you can use for rendering, especially with uh, uh, um, uh, ray trace rendering. And if some of you might have, if you go to the CUDA category, you might have a graphics card here that you can select. Make sure that's shut, right? Use that graphics card, right? It's gonna save you a lot of time, right? It's gonna help you with your performance. Um, now, because I'm running Windows, again, do parallels, for whatever reason, Parallels can't find the graphics card driver for the native graphics card in the MacBook Pro. Parallels is stupid that way. Um, I'm not a computer scientist. Maybe there's a good reason why it can't, but uh, beats me. Um, you know, there are other options there, but I recommend sort of finding that Radeon, AMD, or, uh, or NVIDIA, um, or whatever kind of graphics card you have in using it, okay? Um, particularly if you bought a machine thinking that, you know, this thing's gonna be a powerhouse, right? Um, all right? And when you do that, make sure you hit OK. You don't just exit out and accidentally hit Cancel, right? So that that change takes. All right. I'll just go ahead and hit OK because I didn't really change anything. All right. Other settings. When we do the ray tracing, right? The way ray trace works, and this happens with all the rendering packages I've noticed lately, um, if you do a ray trace setting, what it does is it starts with noise and it gradually resolves from Gaussian noise or static, right? And so the result as you go along get kind of, are still kind of static, they still have a lot of noise to them. What we can do is we can actually download, have Rhino download a denoiser algorithm for free. Okay? And the way we do that is I can type in the command package manager. See in the command line, when I type, I hit package manager. And it brings up the package manager, which is another window here. And these are things that I can add on to Windows, right? I can sort of extend it and, and uh, put plugins in as I need. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to search for denoiser. I don't know why my caps lock was on. Denoiser. 
you can see that there's an NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel denoiser, right? So if you were going back to your CPU, you set your CPU, or sorry, your GPU, right? If you saw that it was an AMD or an NVIDIA uh, graphics card, you could pick one of these, you know, the, the appropriate one, and uh, it'll work quite nicely. In my case, I'm just gonna pick the Intel denoiser. Um, that'll work with my CPU just fine. So I hit, touch that. Um, and I believe you can hit install, then you hit okay. It'll actually tell you that it won't, it, it'll, it'll do some things and it'll tell you that it actually won't be running inside of Rhino until you close Rhino and restart Rhino. You don't have to restart Windows, but you have to close and then restart Rhino and it'll pop up. Next time you open up Rhino, then you'll see it as one of the things that it's loading. Okay. Intel denoiser. Um, what I can do, yeah, let's see. So if I, for instance, I don't, I already have Intel denoiser installed. You can see it's already checked. Um, but if, let's say I wanted to pick NVIDIA denoiser, I could hit install, hit OK, right? It's going to download some things, install some things, um, or prepare some, some installation things. Then when I, when I close Rhino and open it back up, then it'll finish the installation of that, that plugin. Okay. All right, so this will help you as well. Um, and you'll see why when we get to, you know, we actually test the ray tracing here. Okay. Now, a couple of things, right? When you go to a viewport window and I have my perspective sort of dragged over a bit so that it's much larger than normally it is, right? It's, it's not just sharing one quarter of the screen, but it's sharing more like one half of the screen. So I, what I did is I just moved my first roll this divider between my perspective and my right view and just sort of slid things over and make this larger. You can see that I'm not in wireframe or shaded. I'm actually in rendered mode. So in your viewport label, any of your viewport labels, you can go here and change the, the, the view setting, the view um, uh, setting that you have, right? So from wireframe, shaded, render, ghosted, et cetera, right? We're gonna be talking about rendered and ray trace today. Okay. Um, both of them are rendered, are rendering types. In this case, I have this set to rendered, right? And I can move it around and in real time, it sort of gives me those soft shadows, that sort of, um, soft clay sort of rendering, really sort of soft, okay? You can see it's kind of lagging on my system. Um, I'm also recording my screen and writing like probably about, it's gonna be in about eight or 10 gigabytes worth of video to my system right now. So it's, it's a little laggy on my end because I'm also trying to render in real time when I start to move these around. And I've taken all these pipes, all these pipes are poly surfaces. So again, the more poly surfaces you have in your model, the better. All right, um, a couple of things now. Let's talk about settings. So I have this set to rendered. Um, for the moment, I'm just gonna turn this back to wireframe or maybe even shaded. Shaded will be easier to sort of see, but not as heavy as casting a bunch of shadows and things like that. Now, there's a couple of things that I did here that I've made some changes on with the model. So let me just sort of zoom out so you can see that. I'm just going to put these back kind of the way they were before. Expand my perspective view and you can see some of these changes that I've made. All right, so first of all, when I baked this, why, uh, sorry, I baked the trusses, the space frame in the Rhino model, I made sure that they were on their own layer. I have the properties box on at the moment. Let me switch it over to layers, right? So I have this truss curves layer. Apparently I put it on that for some reason. It works for me. I still have all those original layers and all those original geometries that you got with the site model, right? You can see I actually used the spline to define this bottom core, um, the sort of bottom edge of our space frame. I used that to actually trim part of the, the ground plane away that we made earlier. So that's a change that I made. So the reason I did that is because if you think about it in perspective, right, you have like the, the transparent background behind the, the space frame, and then you have the ground, and that, that ground plane was actually like rendered as white, plastic or something, I think. And if I wanted to put trees in, like I, I just don't want any ground plane outside, so I can start to put trees in context in, and I don't have to worry about selecting around the space frame, and I can just put it right back in and drop it in that sort of uh, uh, behind everything else, right? 
Um, so otherwise, things would start getting occluded by our ground plane, which is yeah, the idea is that it would sit above the ground plane, but behind the space frame. And so I just don't want the ground plane there, and I can I can put that in in Photoshop. Later. Another thing I did is I actually exploded these floor slabs, and I expanded up the, the, the sort of fascia plates to become sort of fascia and guardrail. And I thickened it down a little bit of um, uh, thickness there towards the mass. Um, when I exploded, I also can select the floor and select the ceiling underneath as two different surfaces, so I can begin to give them different shaders, right? So let's say I wanted a polished concrete floor, but underneath, you know, um, you know, in that sort of floor to ceiling sandwich, you know, maybe my ceiling is actually um, a drop ceiling, acoustic ceiling panels, or it's wood or something else that, that maybe look nicer than acoustic panels. I'm not a big fan of acoustic panels. But anyway. All right, so. Let me just open up the original site model and show you what we did there. I also added some planters. You know, I was thinking like, ah, oh, you know, we're going to add some, maybe some trees, make this a sort of indoor sort of mall, um, you know, sort of atrium. Maybe it'd be nice to have some green stuff in there. Um, you know, particularly with all this glass, you know, maybe there's uh, lots of borrowed daylight and sunlight to, to grow some stuff in there. Plants are nice air filters. They sort of do it naturally, right? Um, they also, uh, they also, uh, help people concentrate and they're just really great. Plants are super. All right, so anyway. Um, this is the original site model you guys have given me. Right? Okay, just making sure everyone's still awake. All right. Just giving the perspective up here. So one thing you notice, right, this is that curve I was talking about, right? That's that curve that we're using, one of those curves at the point the floor that we're using to create our space frame system. You guys are going to use it, right? It's still there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it to trim off all the outside floor, that ground plane away. I'm just going to remove it, okay? Now, one thing you notice is that if I try to use this as a cutting instrument, it doesn't actually cut all the way through the plane. So if I used it to try to sort of trim or, or split the surface, right, there's no one side and the other side because it doesn't actually go all the way through the edge, right? And so one thing I noticed right away is that I might just redraw this plane, this ground plane, to be a little more useful. Right, so I'm in top view. I'm just going to expand this out. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this grid. I mean, having this weird opaque gray box is not helpful at all to, to sort of understand this, right? And it's just a visual distraction at this point. So I'm just turn that grid off. Here we go. All right. You know, whenever I delete something, I just like automatically assume that it's blown up like dynamite, so I think that it sounds best. Um, and I need to make a surface, so you know, here I have points, curve, surface, right? There's my surface making tools. I can click and hold that out, and all the different ways I can make a surface. I mean, there's more things here than I can shake a stick at, as they used to say back where I lived in the Midwest. And I'm just going to sort of find one. I'm, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually start a point over here for that corner, you move out this way. I'm not really concerned about what it looks like beyond where I can't see it. But I'm going to make sure that this curve extends all the way through so I can use it to sort of trim one from the other. Right? And the other thing I'm doing is I notice that this is bright fluorescent green. It's on the third floor walls layer instead of the ground plane layer. So I'm going to go ahead and select it and go to the properties and change the layer it's on, ground plane. Okay. Maybe I'll just make ground plane the uh, active layer for the moment. All right. And um, I'm just going to type in trim, right? Select the cutting objects. Whenever I type in a command, command line tells me exactly what it needs, right? It's like those inputs on the left-hand side of a widget in Grasshopper, right? Here are the ingredients and the parameters that I need. And then it'll pop something out at the end, right? So it's saying, we'll select the cutting object. So in this case, I'm going to use this curve as a cutting object. Now select the object to trim and the part that I want to trim away and disappear forever. There it is. All right. And so you can see now that my ground plane is trimmed away. Right. Okay. Great. So that's helpful. Now another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in here um, and let's talk about what I did. And again, I'm recording this so you can always go back in and take a look 
you know, if you're like, what did he do? All right, I'll just do it here on this first, sorry, second floor sort of mezzanine, this slab right here, All right? So this magenta colored slab, I'm just gonna select it, I'm gonna type in the command explode, and it said exploded a poly surface that was all closed up into six surfaces, right? So I have the top face, the bottom face, and all four side faces, right? Three of those are pretty straight, and the other one's a sort of windy serpentine sort of S shape. All right. And it's that windy serpentine S shape that I'm selecting. Right? I'm gonna go back to my four viewports. I'm gonna zoom in on this, right? So here it is from front view, right? So I can see it from the side. Because what I wanna do is I'm gonna scale it up like this. Okay? So I'm gonna make it part of a railing for that second floor mezzanine overlooking our, our, um, our atrium, right? So it's really important, right? By code, you can't just put a slab there and just let people like walk right off of it if they have a walking stick. The kids gets too close to the edge, and walk, right? It would be awful, and you're responsible for the, the life, safety, and uh, of, of anybody from, in the public that's using these things. So um, by code, you have, to, you have to include that, and there's all kinds of constraints about um, how these things can do it and how, how, how far apart, you know, railing can be spaced so people don't get their head stuck in it. You'd be surprised. Um, or whatever, right? So um, kids do those sorts of kinds of crazy things. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to the scale tool and say scale 1D. I'm holding down to get not just the scale 3D, but the scale 1D. And I'm just going to make that bigger. How much bigger? Well, that was two feet. So I'm just going to eyeball this, but I'm going to say there. All right. And I can look at it in perspective view and just eyeball it and sort of see if that looks good. If I wanted to be very precise, I could actually click that in. Um, but I don't really care. It's Monday, and um, you know I'm not going to hand this to a builder to, to make. Or this isn't going into Revit to be detailed out further. So you know I don't care. <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, so and I'm recording this too. Oh, wow, that's great. All right, so. You can see we have a railing, but it's paper thin. It's just one surface, right? So let's give it just a little bit of oomph, right? Let's make it look like it's actually made out of like materials, so it's a matter, right? Materials all have thickness. Even a piece of paper has thickness if you measure it. So, you know, you just need a micrometer or something. Mic that bad boy, digital calipers. All right, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna offset it, okay? So if I type in offset, right? You can see there's several different offset tools. So the regular offset is for curves. But if you look down, there's offset surf, S-R-F. That's short for surface, right? So we'll go to offset surface. All right, and I'm gonna look at the parameters here, right? It says, how far am I gonna offset? Should it be a solid? In other words, you fill in the sides, right? Is it offsets, you know, two, one face and the other? Do you wanna fill in the, the sides or not? Um, do I want to? Do you want me to offset both directions or just one direction? Right, right now it's at both sides no, and then it's giving me the arrows telling me which side it would it would offset to. And I could use that, or I could say flip and turn it the other direction. Right, and offset the other side. So in this case, I think I'm just going to say solid yes, distance one, both sides no, probably not. Yeah, why not? Yes, I'll just say yes. And uh, delete input, yes. Yeah. So, right, so it's saying distance of one. So it's going to offset this way one and this way one. Remove the inside and then stitch around and make it a solid. So that, that's actually pretty handy if we use these settings, these parameters, and have them set correctly. Um, this is going to take care of a lot of modeling for us. And in fact, there it is, right? So, all right. And now, just so we're, 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 we're straight here. You know, the transition between what's wall, right? What's sort of uh, um, bulkhead and what's, what's soffit behind, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lower this about an inch, right? So it looks like the wall sort of wraps back and then back up, and then we filled in the rest with our ceiling that we'll, we'll give some sort of shader material to later, right? Um, so usually, unless you can ensure and you really want those two things to be flush, right, you could purposefully make this thing about, you know, a bulkhead, right? That's what we usually call those, where the drywall comes down 
and then you start the ceiling, the ceiling comes to it. Um, and that way, you don't see like the irregularities when you're in the atrium. Like you don't see like where you know this is moved and suddenly this is drooping and things like that. Right. So it's all about the sort of craft of knowing how these things move and what the best practices are. So in this case, I'm just going to move it down you know, about an inch or two. There. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to do that for the, the other floor and then also the ceiling. So that's how I did that. Want me to do it one more time just to demonstrate? All right. Really quickly, first step I have one closed poly surface, it's all joined together. So I can type in explode. I'll explode it. Now it's a top face, a bottom face, and all four side faces, right? Um, what I'm mostly interested in at the moment is this sort of serpentine, sort of, you know, curvy, weird front face, right? So I select that. I'm going to go back into my side view, which is where I'm most equipped to move things up in the Z direction, very precisely. And I'm going to go to scale, and I'm going to hold until I get to, there's 3D scale, 2D scale, and 1D scale. There's also non-uniform scale and scale by plane. I'm going to use the scale 1D. So I'm just going to scale in the Z direction. And so I'm going to say scale from here. This is the base point. That's the reference point. This is the target point. I'm just going to basically do the same thing I did before. So I just scaled it upwards, just in the Z direction, 1D. Now I'm going to offset it to give it some thickness. Offset, offset. And the key thing is I, here's the, the damn shame here. I, I usually I get in the habit of just needing to offset instead of offset surface. So make sure you get an offset surface. You'll be able to select that surface. And make sure these parameters are set correctly, right? Distance, the amount that you're going to offset. Both sides, yes or no. Solid, yes or no. Um, if it's not both sides, then you need to flip it to make sure it's offset to the right side, right? Here's a front and a back. So making sure that that's set correctly. Um, I'm saying both sides, yes. Solid, yes. Distance, one. And there we are. And then one last thing, I'm just going to select it again, go back to my side view where I can move it up and down in Z carefully. I'm just going to move it down one unit, one inch in this case, right? So that's just a slight bulkhead um, before the ceiling. So it has a place to, to receive the that ceiling back behind it. Underneath. All right. Same thing for the roof. The roof is a little less thick, but same thing. You can explode it. Spin it upwards like a parapet, right? Um, give it some thickness and then also move it down an inch just so you have, again, that bulkhead condition there. That sort of condition that where, you, where you're negotiating where ceiling and wall meet, right? which is really important. Okay. One other thing I did, I baked my grasshopper stuff in, into this, right? The, all the pipe stuff. Um, that's in the, the other one that I'll, I'll pull up in a minute. Right, this is the, the base condition, base model, so where you're starting, right? So you might already have all of the, the space frame in here, right? You turn that off and start to, to model some of this other stuff, right? Again, I just thought, like, as soon as I, like, took our, your site model that I gave you in, I'm like, I started looking at it in perspective, I'm like, you know, it looks kind of lame, like, we can do a little better than this, like, add some details. And that's, what's, that's what happens when you start to look at things at eye level, right? Like, in perspective, you go, well, am I really fooled or not? Like, does this look like it, it's starting to turn into architecture? Or does it look like just a bunch of, you know, really primitive masses, right? And so trying to find that sort of, uh, um, at this stage, I would say trying to find that sweet spot and giving yourself um, uh, uh, enough detail that it, that you're, it looks nice, right, is, is part of this. And sometimes you don't necessarily see that in plan or in a sort of zoomed out perspective. But when you start to really you know, look at rendering, where you're going to set the camera, where you're going to be standing, as a viewer, how I experience it, right? You say, oh, gosh, I can, like, see where this wall and these things don't actually match up, right? You need to fix that. Or I can see, you know, where I want to put a ceiling here, but I wouldn't want to make look like that material wraps upwards of the wall, right? Um, so it's, it's that sort of stuff, right? You start to notice these things a little more, right? It's the kind of stuff you notice when you're walking around anyway. Have anybody noticed that? Like after architecture, a couple of years of architecture school, you like you walk around and you start noticing things that you never did before, especially Las Vegas. But even outside campus, 
walking down you know, freaking Maryland Parkway to lunch or something, right? You start to notice things, right? How architecture meets the ground, nasty looking corner that they ne never anticipated, really bad detailing around where the, the roof, um, and so like the few, few days of, of rain that we get per year, um, you like see water stains or, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? You start to notice that stuff a lot more, right? Um, or if you're uh, using a wheelchair, like the, the, the sidewalks here, just four. Right? So campus is not bad, but we can do a lot better than Trotman. Um, uh, Maryland Parkway, that's for sure. Anyway, uh, so yeah, anyway, this is, uh, this is it. Um, if I wanted to make some of those planters, right, here's how I did it. Um, for what it's worth, you can you can make them however you want, but you know I just wanted to make make it look like there would actually be a planter there to hold the um, the bulb of a tree, right, the root bulb, and uh, allow a, a tree of a certain size to grow in, in the right environment. Um, so uh, here's what I did. I it's very silly. I I like went in top view and I made a box, and then another box inside that box, right. So I figured maybe this is like a you know, extrude these up and then I can sit down on the planter and then in the middle there's a tree. And, you know, it's pretty, pretty standard. I mean, I could make something that's kind of really curvy and stuff. And so what I do is I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna extrude it upwards and make sure it's solid. Then I'm gonna make a copy of it, but I'm gonna run it in a ray along this curve so that it actually follows, like the, maybe the stripes down a street or something. Like it follows along our, uh, our spine there. Um, so let's see. I could probably draw a better box than that too. Let's see. There we go. Try to make it look like I'm trying here. All right. Um, and uh, extrude, extrude curves. So what's interesting about this is that I have an inside and outside curve. What's going on here? What in the world? Okay. Um, here, I'll tell you what. What I'll do is I'll just make a, um, a copy of this box, but scale it. So let me go to scale. And for the base point, I'm going to find the midpoint, and the midpoint, and the hypothetical center point. And then um, for a reference point, I'll just do this. There we go. Oh, and I forgot to hit yes on copy. Damn. I always hate that. All right, sorry. Pardon my language. Mid, mid, there we go. All right, now we're cooking. All right, there, boom, all right. Ay, ay, ay. Now maybe these will extrude together nicely, hopefully. Don't know why they wouldn't. And in fact, when I say um, solid yes, when it, when it sees that there's something on the inside of a larger curve, that's, and they're both closed, then the inside curve becomes an island, right? So what's nice about this, if I hit both sides, no, solid, yes, um, you can see that I actually have a mass that's hollow in this inside, right? Which is nice. That's kind of the donut that I wanted. And uh, how tall would this be? How tall should we make this? 20 inches? I don't know. What, yeah, probably about 20 inches. Measure a chair if you want. In Z. There we go. All right. So there's that. And now I can array this along a curve. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to center this up mid to that curve. I can get rid of these old curves. Okay. There's lots of ways to make copies, but let's just talk about this for a moment, right? So this toolbar in Rhino, just in case you don't remember from you know, years past and you haven't been using it in the studio, which would be a damn shame because that's the way you learn. Points, curves, surfaces, how we make them, how we modify them. Then there's a bunch of general, general sort of modification tools down there. The split, trim, explode, join, etc. Then there's these right here. I'm gonna click and hold those out. But that's all the sort of transforms that we can do. If I click and hold, you can see that there's all these useful tools, things like move, rotate, scale, shear, then twist, uh, arrays, lots of various arrays, um, etc. So. One of the things we can do is we can array things in a grid if we wanted to. We could arrange things in polar uh, radial fashion, um, or we can array things along a curve. So select the objects to array. This, 
along which path curve? This. How many items in the distance, or the distance between them? In this case, I'm going to say, I want eight of these. Let's try it. Mm, nine. Oh, there they are. OK. So we have nine of them along that curve, and they start to actually follow along the curve. The curve right? All right. So that was the quick, easy way of doing that. So really simple. Drawing some things on the ground, screwing them up, making sure they're solid. Do some rectangles, extrude curve. And then array a long curve. Again, don't worry, you can always go back to the video if you want to see this. All right, so let me go back. This is like a cooking show. Let me go back to the, the thing that's been in the oven for 40 minutes. We'll pull it out. It's like Martha Stewart. All right, so there we have it, right? So that's where I get this. Let me turn it on to shaded. All right. OK. So once we have geometry in place, um, we're, we're, in good, we're in a good place, right? Um, that's half the struggle, honestly. Um, you won't think that when it comes time to render the first time, but you'll get used to it, and then it'll become uh, easier and lighter for you. Um, so let's talk about first. Uh, the first part of rendering then, camera. So we know by instinct that when we use our right mouse button in the orthographic views that we start to pan, right? We're just basically just shifting our camera around, right? As we're looking orthographically in plan or elevation view, right? And in perspective, if we use the right mouse button, we tumble. We sort of rotate the model around relative to the camera, right? If we hold down the shift key with our right mouse button, we can pan our camera around, right? OK. Now, what's really uh, nice here is that we can begin to start to align things, right? So there's several things I want to do here. I want to sort of think about the, the size and shape or aspect ratio of the frame, right? Our viewport in this case. Um, I also want to position our camera. And it's really important, right? Like if I wanted to feel like I'm immersed in this space inside this atrium, I need to get down on the ground and become, a, in my case, a six foot one person. Some of you might be five foot four, whatever, right? Like, but think about eye level, where your eye level is. Right? Right? That's what we're trying to identify. So if this is uh, zero, this is 10 feet, then the, the floor, the finished floor above is 12 feet, Right? I want my eye level to be somewhere in here, right? Over five feet, but not, you know, not too much higher than, you know, you don't want it to look like you're a minute bull seven feet tall or something, right? Okay. And so trying to establish eye level in your perspective is really important. Um, and so if you think about the scale of this, right? I said zero, um, say 10 feet from floor to ceiling, right? So now if I think, Halfway is five feet, a little past that is five and a half, a little past that is six feet. Right? And so from down there, we're, we're not really seeing the floors of the second and third floor, obviously, right? We just see the ceilings. Right? Um, yeah, right. So let's see, am I forgetting anything? Position, eye level, frame aspect resolution, lens setting, saving views, right. So also when I'm, per, I'm in perspective view and I don't have anything, any of my geometry selected, and I go to the properties box, you'll notice that it actually has the properties of the viewport. It has the size of the viewport, what kind of projection the viewport is, whether it's orthographic, whether it's uh, uh, parallel, which is another form of isometric, right? Um, like a parallax drawing, or perspective, perspectival, right? And there's, there's like perspective, and there's also two point perspective. You know, two point perspective tries to force all the vertical to be truly vertical, not a three point perspective. Anyway, camera, underneath that we have a few settings, and one of them is towards the location of the camera, and then also the target location of the camera. It's a lens link. How many of you used a, a DSLR, right? Like a Nikon or Canon, right? Look at the lens. Yeah? All right. And when you zoom in or out, that's measured in millimeters, right? Yeah? 
So pretty typical setting. Most lenses span from either one side or the other side or both sides the 35 millimeter lens, right? And if you think about lower than 35, you're getting into wider angle lenses, right? This is the smallest number. The more it looks like you zoom out, the more you see, the more extremely exaggerated certain angles get, right? The higher that number, the more zoomed in you get. Telephoto lenses, right? Um, you lose the perspective over time, but like a 200 millimeter telephoto lens, you can actually see off in the distance by the way. Right? All right, so by default, because of our peripheral vision, human eye can approximate it around 28 millimeters. So this is usually uh, typically set to 50 millimeters. I actually have a, uh, a 50 millimeter uh, lens. It's very limited in what you can see, actually. So I recommend adjusting that down, right? So at least 35 millimeter, if not 28, if not 25. In this case, I had an interior shot. I wanted to look grand and huge with a wide angle lens, right? Like if I was photographing for real, I would bring my 18 millimeter lens with me, right? Really get as much of that bad boy as I can. That nice, expansive, vast space, daylit with big, freaking awesome space frame and all that other stuff. Some trees growing in these incredible planters that I modeled in two seconds. That, right? Yeah. All right. So. I can, of course, change that, right? So here's what typically is looking at, 50 millimeter. It's like, <laughs> I can't show anything. It's like it's too zoomed in, right? So to zoom out, to make it wider angle, right? Here's a 30, typical 35 millimeter lens. The human eye is somewhere in the neighborhood between 25 and 30, usually around 28 approximated. Sometimes I go even crazier, like 18 millimeter. Mm -mm -mm. All right. so. If I really want to feel like I'm there uh, and, uh, and, uh, and small in this really large space, I can, I can make a wide angle, okay? And once I get that set up, I go, you know, this is going to be probably the greatest perspective I've ever done up until now in my entire life, right? I mean, every drawing you do is going to be the best one that you've ever done, right? And you just keep building, right? So that's the way I think about it. Sometimes it's right. I want to save that view, right? Because I might accidentally hit my right mouse button and go, oh, shh, what? Like, no, what happens? Like, I had that view set up perfectly. It's in exactly the right place. It's exactly the right height, point in the exact right place, right? It had everything set, right? Um, I accidentally screwed up the lens length and, you know, everything else. How do I get back to that? Right? Okay. So, if I go to the viewport label, right, you can change your viewport to any of these views, right? So for instance, if I mess up the top view and you want to get back to the top view, you can go back to the viewport label, go to set view, and turn back to the top, the bottom, right back. So I have several perspective viewports, and if you want to float your boat. Down here at the bottom, I have several that probably aren't up here at the moment. I know the perspective of one I found is from above the nature, right? And I have this option called named views. So if I bring up the named views box, it gives me an, an option for saving the current view, right? In this case, I have, you see how my uh, perspective label, that viewport label is blue, so I like it, that viewport. So if I hit that save button, it would save that view and all the parameters and settings around. Right? And then it also has this box and tells me which views I've already saved, right? So in this case, I've already saved this view. It's called Eye Level Perspective 01 at Ground. Double click, boom, go right back to it. Okay. I screw around again. I mess things up big time. I accidentally change this and everything else. Wait for it, wait for it, set view. Now, all my saved views are down here at the bottom as well. Right? I can just go back to Eye Level Perspective 01. Lens length is set back to 18 millimeter and right back there, right? So that's really important. You don't want to be like, you know, like having this constantly shift on you. Once you establish that perfect shot, save it, save it, save it, save it. So you go back to it. That's the perspective I want to see at the very end. Um, as you render it out, you add detail to it, then we uh, post produce, pro post do the post production, um, post produce, it's not out of it in Photoshop afterwards, et cetera, right? So, all right, so again, if I get this in the exact right position that I need to, I go set view, named views, right? I can 
hit the button and ask me, well, what do you want to save this uh, view as? What do you want to label it as? Right, I can type in a label, hit OK, and that becomes another one of my viewports, just like top and bottom and right and side and uh, perspective and parallel and all those others. Okay. You can see I also have one from above. Oop, let's see. Set view from above, right? From up higher. This would be like if I'm on a scissor lift or something looking down across the atrium. Right? I don't recommend doing this because it, it looks really odd. First of all, the, the bottom's cut off. And you know you wouldn't be in a helicopter in a two-story space or three-story space. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, if you wanted to come over here and make it look like you're standing here looking out over this, the atrium, over the railing or something, then you could do that, right? You could put some people up here, people down there, people up there, whatever. But I do recommend establishing one really good, solid, high-level perspective from that ground floor within the atrium with all those other trays sort of stacked off to the side and you can see. So. So we're going over a lot in a short amount of time, aren't we? And that's why we're going to need two days, because we're going to review on Wednesday and then add to it. Um, camera position, saving views, frame aspect ratio, resolution, and size. So what's interesting is if I go look over here where properties and layers are, right? I think by default you also have render settings. So this tab, pretty standard for most software, like you'll have like a sphere with a blue shade around it. That's rendering settings. Um, so here's where you would say, well, yeah, I wanted to render the dimensions of the viewport. You can give it a DPI. So that's the number of pixels per inch, right? So that's how much information can be generated across um, this. So for instance, you said, uh, let's see, the size needs to be set the inches, right? set the size to inches. And you say it needs to be 11 by 17, right? Which is pretty large, actually. Um, then you could say, well, how many DPI do I want? So, um, in that case, you said 300 DPI, you have 300 times 11 going down and 300 times 17 going across. Um, you can also set the quality, draft quality versus best quality. Let's see. I'm going to leave mine at draft quality, but you have good quality and final quality as well. Okay. There's a number of these settings here, and let's take a look at them really quickly. For backdrop, I have solid color set, but then I have transparent background set. So, um, and Rhino is going to show me a solid color that I picked as white. When it renders it out and I save it as a PNG file or a zip file, it's going to preserve that transparent background. So everything that's white with no geometry in the background will actually be transparent background. Okay. Which is really important when you try to layer things behind the scene um, in Photoshop, right? So putting the sky in, you don't have to try to select all the white triangles and weird shapes in there, you can just basically, all those will be cleared out. I turn the ground plane off, because again, I don't want that ground plane on the outside. Right? Otherwise, they'll put this white clay ground plane underneath everything, and um, you don't want that for this, for this exercise anyway. Okay. Lighting down here, we'll get to in a moment, but just wanted to bring those up, right? So um, if I did this right now, it'd be the viewport size. In this case, it's telling you the viewport size is 1892 by 1640 something. That's off, just off the, the side of my viewport. 62, 1642, right? So that'd be the, in, uh, in pixels. Um, so then at 72 DPI, you can begin to sort of understand how many, how much you have in inches, right? Um, in this case, what I would do is I would probably, if I want to be very specific about a size, first of all, I don't know what this is doing, but it's, Pause for a moment. I think it's because I slightly adjusted the size of my viewport, which is another annoying parallel thing that seems to be lagging these days. Um, but what I can do is I can go to that size and I will in a few minutes and that disappears. Um, I can change the so pixels, I can go to inches, set the inches, and I can set the DPI. Right? So for printing things, you want 300 DPI, minimum. So you do DPI, and that's pretty chintzy if you're going to try to you know, blow something up or or print something at a decent size, right? Um, so uh, let's say I wanted to, oh, come on, what's it doing? Okay, so let's say I wanted to change this. I can go to size, and instead of pixels, I can go to inches. Um, lock to, 
So in this case, it's 26 inches by 22 something inches. And then I could set my DPI from there. Oftentimes, what I find is that when it comes to the viewport aspect ratio, I like to set things very specifically, right? So I'm, sometimes I get to like 9.16 or 16.9, right? You know, if it's white screen or ball um, or square or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm also thinking about that paper size. So I'm thinking, you know, in terms of this being plotted, um, then what size am I going with? What's the module? Is it 12 inch module, 6 inch module, 18 inch module? Right? Then I'm thinking in terms of like 12 by 12 or um, 12 by 6 or 6 by 12, and then the DPI afterwards, right? So I'm always trying to give myself some wiggle room here um, with the pretty standard workflow of how that might work. Um, it also oftentimes helps if you want to get a specific size or specific aspect ratio. I plug into a second monitor in my office. With, that's much larger than my stupid laptop screen running Windows. Um, and, uh, and then I have a lot of latitude in how I can start to drag and make this frame exactly the way I want. Okay? Um, but you can also change the aspect ratios here. Right? So if I wanted to do a 16.9, let's see. Then what's going to do, centered, centered here, it's going to do a, a 16.9, so 1920 by 1080 around. Um, and let's see here. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. In this case, I'm just going to tell it to use the viewport. All right, so if you're doing something that's pixelated, that DPI, the size, that matters. Okay? Um, the other thing is the quality, and I'll leave that graph quality for right now for illustration purposes. But typically, on your end, I probably set that after after testing a few things, making sure I have like what I need at draft quality. When I do a, another render, I probably set that to the advanced step up and try it again and see how much longer it takes. I think for ray tracing, it doesn't take like each. I think with the ray trace, all it does is it doubles the amount of passes it makes. Um, and so, like maybe from 500 to 1,000 passes, or something like that, right? So you know you understand maybe with, with rendering what it does is it it's the number of passes and it starts to resolve ambiguity and bounce light around and try to solve things mathematically, right? So the number of passes you have um, directly affects the quality that you have and the accuracy that you have. Right? So um, you're always sort of approaching accuracy uh, depending on the number of passes that you have. All right, and so that's it, right? Getting that camera, getting the size, getting that frame, right? Making sure you save that view once you have it just right. right? That's big, big time important. Um, and, and again, we went to the render settings, right? So it's that blue sphere tab, right? If you can't find that tab in your settings here, you can go to render, pull down, and find render settings down at the bottom, render properties down at the bottom. And it might even bring up a little box that's floating. Right? Instead of, you can always drag and drop that box over here to dock it over here on the, on the right if it's not there, if you prefer it to be there. You can see there's a material editor, an environmental editor, a render of properties, um, and some other things here, right, that we'll get to in just a bit. Whew. All right, so camera, geometry, settings. How are we doing? We have a little bit of time to talk about light, shall we? Yeah, all right. Okay, so. Today is beautiful. I was out there at 5.30 in the morning, and it was like 70 degrees. It felt like the air conditioning was on outside. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see this, but that's about as clear as sky as you can get, right? Nice and thin to bed snow. In spite of it looking clear, there's lots of particulates and gases in our atmosphere that scatter the light around reflect it, refract it, and bounce it, right? And as a result, the sky looks blue. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely, right? Okay, so we have direct light, direct sun rays from the sun. We make it all the way through, cast these nice bit of shadows on the ground, right? And depending on the time of year, the time of day, right, that's going to be from a particular direction. Yeah, you know that. We're about to hit an equinox, right? September 21st. 
that's this week, that's still coming up in two days. Next time we meet, in fact, will be in equinox. So I mean, the sun will be uh, 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 rising due east and, and then uh, setting due west, right? Um, about equal 12, 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of daylight. Yeah, anyway. So uh, you get the idea, right? So the sky's been really high in the sky, sort of rising in the northeast and setting in the northwest. At this point, it's where it's sort of, you know, the mid-ground between the, the two solstices, right? Okay. So March 21st and September 21st, pretty much carbon copies of each other, um, those, those uh, elbow seasons, those swing seasons. Um, then we have the sky vault, right? So we have all the, the um, light that becomes ambient light that's being scattered around that still hits, right? That isn't necessarily a direct ray. Right? We know this because if we stand in the shadow of the building, right, we can still see things around us. It's not like we're completely devoid of all light, right? Because there's light also being bounced around the atmosphere, right? And there's light hitting things and then bouncing back to us. Absolutely, right? So, for instance, we can look out that window and we can see the MGM down the street, right? And we can see it because light's hitting it and bouncing back to our eyes. Really far away, but still bouncing back to our eyes, right? right? And in ground, in sidewalk, in places where they're giving shadows, right, in the direct line. Okay? And so when we drive, you know, sometimes it's, we can sort of take care of the sun above us, but sometimes it's the, the ground plane that's really too bright, you know, because it's all that stuff hitting the ground and coming back in our eyes. Right? It's like I can see the ground too well. It's like it's, uh, it makes me want to sneeze or yawn or something, right? So, um, Right, so what we can do is we can simulate both. In most rendering engines, that's what we do, right? We have the sky, the daylight, and then we have the sun, the direct sun. And in Rhino, it's the same way. We have two lighting systems, the sun and the skylight. Right? Again, I'm in the render settings. I just still have those up. I'm gonna move these over just so we can see them a little better. Give them a little more emphasis by giving a little more screen real estate here. Maybe. Sometimes a day. Let's see. There we go. Boom. All right. So we were just here looking at the backdrop, and above that was the quality and the aspect ratio and size, right? Resolution, quality, backdrop. Down here for lighting, we have sun and skylight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my perspective view to render mode so that we can start to see the difference as I toggle different light settings on and off, right? Different light systems on and off. Turn this to rendered. All right. So first of all, let's turn off the sun. There. Now we just have the sky going, right? So we have all the diffuse light, all the stuff that's bouncing off of things, and no direct direct, crisp, cracks, shadows, but soft shadows, right? So we see the, the definition of particular faces and surfaces, right? Based off of the amount of light that's in them. It's really interesting how it does this, right? So what it does is it takes your, your model, which is a bunch of surfaces, and it converts them into a, a triangulated mesh. And it takes each triangle, there might be millions, thousands or millions of them, and it takes all the, the skylight and it looks and sees what reflects off of that one triangle. And it calculates the next triangle using all the skylights, sky vault, plus whatever is reflected off that first triangle. And the third one, based off of, so iteratively it solves until it gets all the way around, and it's solving for the last triangle with all the other triangles reflecting now and then. Then it goes back and does it again, and again and again. The more times it does it, the more optimal it gets, right? So um, it's amazing that it actually does this in real time by some fancy cheat cheat, right? Like it's sort of a cheat code for it, but um, it does, right? So it does this in real time, I can move this around and sort of see it, rather than having to render all the time. But you can see that's what the skylight does. And with the skylight, there's several settings here that we can use, right? There's the intensity, how bright the how bright it is, right? We all know this, like how many of you have been in like your living room or something, you know, someplace with a window, you, you don't have any lights on, um, you know, and then suddenly the sun goes behind the clouds and you notice it visibly gets darker in the, in the room, right? Um, you know, like especially monsoon season, which I think is officially over now, it seems like. 
Um, right? We can tone down the intensity, right? And suddenly we get less less light, right? Um, we can also use a custom environment for skylighting, right? So that sky dome is something that you can actually get from weather data. Um, this is using a specific airport. Um, you can click on here and load different types of environments. Um, outdoor environments, indoor environments, right? Uh, you can see there's a number of them here. There's um, airports around the world. There's interiors, generic things, sky, and studios. Um, you know, that, whatever the sort of situation is. In this case, I picked a, a sort of airport because I'm thinking this is almost like an airport terminal, right? Give that outdoor, you know, out, we look out this way, we see a bunch of airplanes docked, right? And that way it's all the, uh, all the places where we drink beer while we're waiting around for the airplane, right? You know, that sort of thing. Or duty-free shops and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. Now, let's turn on the sun. Right, so right, right away, Without ray tracing, you can start to see shadows and bright spots from the sun, right? All right. You can start to see crisper shadows. They get crisper as they get closer to the objects, the, the geometries that are casting them. Um, but still, they're not very clear because this is just the rendered mode, not ray trace, right? So ray trace like, literally takes the sun rays and traces them across, right? We'll get to that in a moment. How are we doing on time? We're still all right. All right. I can go to the sun settings, and as we know, these shadows, the geometry of the shadows being cast are directly dependent on the position of the sun in our sky, right? Our, our, our relationship with the sun. Um, so we can think about both azimuth, sorry, azimuth and altitude, right? We could also just give it our location, right? So we could say, turn off manual control. First of all, here's what manual control does. I can basically change the position of the, the sun, and of course the shadows change, right? So I can make the sun higher or lower, or coming from a different direction. I could turn off manual control and give it our location. Um, in this case, I could say we're in Las Vegas, Nevada. And then I could tell it exactly the time of year, what year, the time of month, the day, the time of day, um, whether it's daylight savings or not, and I'll calculate exactly where the, the sky is. So what's today? The 19th? September 19th. Um, why am I doing this the hard way? There we go. At uh, 11, 12 AM, right? All right, so that's where our sun would be, right? Now that's assuming that y positive is north and x positive is east, and x negative is west, y positive is south. And we're looking at our normal top view. We could rearrange from there, or we could tell where the sun position, or sorry, our normal position is. Sorry. But, um, all right, one last thing, because I want you to try this out. I'm going to turn the sun off, and I'm just going to take this white clay soft shadow rendering. We haven't looked at materials yet, so don't worry about that. We'll get to that on Monday, or sorry, Wednesday. Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and capture this, this view. I'm going to go to make sure that this is the active uh, viewport. I'm going to go to view, capture, to file. So when it comes to the soft shadow rendering, we can do it here without having to render things out again. We can tell it, it's going to tell us the size of our viewport, 1643 by 1642 number of pixels. We can tell it to scale it, make it twice as large um, if we want, right? In which case, we'll make it four times larger the amount of information. Two times this way, two times that way, square of that four, right? So, um, whether we want to keep the transparent background, if we always want to have checked. And so, I'm just going to hit OK. If this is big enough, 1643. If it's not big enough, I can always scale this up bigger. So if I scale it up twice, it's going to be 3286 by 3284. I'll just turn it back to 1 and hit OK. Right, it's going to ask us where we want to save. If I hit JPEG, it's going to flatten everything and, and get rid of that alpha channel. The transparent background will become a white or black or gray stuff. Yeah. So I want to make sure I either 
I want to make sure I select PNG, maybe TIFF. I think that TIFF will preserve copy channels. I always pick PNG because I don't care. Make sure you save as a PNG file to preserve that transparent background. Okay? You can hit it on desktop and save it. If you want to be bold, you can then turn on the sun. And this is the last step. I'd like for each of you to try this when you don't have like something pressing going on, so, like before you go to bed. And just sort of see how quick or slow it's running. You can turn that on, turn the sun back on, turn the skylight on, and hit the render button. What's going to do is going to pop up a new render window, and you'll see it start scanning through. Because mine is just using the CPU and not going, the graphics card might be super slow. Okay? But there's two things you'll notice here. One is that you'll see this information. So path ray tracing samples. I'm going to try to do 50 samples for me, and it's still doing one, and it's already been eight, nine, ten, ten seconds. That's really slow, actually. Yours should go faster than this if you're using your GPU. Two, you'll notice that there's a denoiser option down here. And after about 10 passes or so, you can turn that denoiser on, and it'll you'll sort of be negotiating between two competing constraints. One is that you want to get rid of the noise, the static, right? Um, but at the same time, you don't want to lose too much detail, like for shaders and wood patterns and things like that. So, um, or edges, you don't want those to look too fuzzy. So at a certain point, you'll, that's what I want you to get used to. I want you to sort of see this and just see what happens when you do this, right? And keep in mind, look at how long it takes for one pass, how long it takes for two passes, how long it takes when it completes if you let it complete all the way. If it's going slow like mine, you don't want to let it complete all the way, you can hit pause or you can hit that red stop button, right? It might take a few minutes for it to go, right? But it'll eventually stop and then you can close things out. So really quickly, you can see, okay, finally did the first pass. You can see how noisy it is. Obviously, one pass isn't enough. Usually, I'd want to do 500 or 1,000 passes, right, um, in order to get it to a place where then I can just quickly do some, some noise cancellation and get rid of whatever is left. Um, once it's get up to about 10, um, it gets a lot more clear. But uh, that's what I want you to do between now and Wednesday is come back on Wednesday Prepare to talk about what went well and what didn't. Right? If you ran into problems, come with questions. Right? But try your best to go through the step by step. I'm going to upload this video as soon as I get back to my office to YouTube. And as soon as it's up, done processing on YouTube, I'll, I'll embed it into that, that page for today in Canvas. So if you need to refer back to it tonight or tomorrow, you can. Okay? Um, but I want you to try your best. Look at those daylight settings, look at the sunlight settings. Um, position your camera, save a view or two that you think you want to try. And, uh, and then try to export out a soft shadow rendering with the capture command. And then try to run a render, a ray trace render. This is the ray trace. So try your best to follow the steps. You can see I'm only on sample 3 of 50. Right? That's really kind of slow. Yours should be turning things out if you have a decent GPU. All right, well, thanks so much for your patience. We're two minutes behind, thanks for staying. And if you have any questions, um, I don't know how much I'm going to be on campus tomorrow. Um, like, our, my wife had a car accident, we have to, like, kind of go to read signs and things and all this other stuff. So we can get insurance money to put down payment on a new car. There's just no new cars, like, around. Really terrible. So, anyway, I'm going to be running a bunch of errands around town tomorrow, but I will be responsive to email, so just feel free to email. Okay. All right. Okay, good luck. See you on Wednesday. We'll talk more. We haven't even scratched the surface on materials yet. Mm. So good. All right. So let me try to close this out. Let me also try to stop the recording.